Good afternoon. No, it's not afternoon anymore. It's evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm losing track of time. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are here together uh, for a session on building partnerships on and off campus. Uh, this is B1 uh, of the B sessions. All righty. So yes, so this session is uh, B1 building partnerships on and off campus. So this session is going to focus on sharing um, our approaches to collaboration and building relationships. Um, so something along the lines of best practices, ways of collaborating, building relationships with other campus units, um, the disability community, other organizations beyond the university, um, so we're asking the questions, you know, how did our panelists reach out, what guided their efforts, and what have they learned along the way? And so we have four lovely presenters, Liz, Emily, Natty, and Karen, and they will all introduce themselves and share their experiences and advice. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end of the session. So the first person, um, the first presenter will be Liz. Take it away, Liz. Thank you, Javin. Uh, hello, my name is Liz Thompson. I use they, them, their pronouns. I describe myself as a dark-skinned Vietnamese person with black shaved hair, black glasses, and black eyes. And um, I'm wearing a uh, altered uh, tank top this gray, teal, and yellow, and in the background is my uh, UIC diploma and Lavender graduation poster. Uh, today, I'll be coming from the perspective of being the director at the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Intercultural Programs at the University of Minnesota Morris campus, and also Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, where I've been in that position for three years now. And so I would like to um, offer three things in the time. And so just to lay a little bit of foundation, uh, the Morris campus is a small liberal arts part of the systems campus. So currently we have about only 1,100 students and we have uh, the Equity, Diversity, and Intercultural Programs Office. So um, with that, when I was hired about three years ago, uh, I do think one of the uh, contributions and assets that um, hopefully set me apart from other candidates was the disability uh, cultural uh, experience and the disability studies experience as well. Um, I've gotten to know that the campus has had, of course, like um, had other, you know, uh, experiences and and brought in disability. Um, so okay, so just so I have um, three things I'd like to share, and I will share my screen. So the first thing I will share is a big grid, and this really this. Symposium came at a very um, great timing because I was doing this work anyway for a three-year review of the pro of of our office programs. So let's see. Um, can you see my desktop? Thank you. Okay, so here, um, so I made this massive grid <laughs> of all the programs from when I started um, basically in August of 2019, and then scrolling down to basically, you know, a month ago. And so I have the date, the name of the program, and these are all in columns, date, name of the program, and then um, about 20 different columns uh, and it's a lot and I'm happy to put it also in, in the chat 
Um, but basically the top row, um, I was thinking like, how would I tag these programs? Um, I think one of the biggest uh, impacts of after finishing my PhD this year has been more around data <laughs> and data analysis. Um, so, and then um, the different rows have all the different programs. Um, I did not do this alone. I already had this list anyway as, as this Google Doc calendar. And then I worked with one of our student worker educators to get it in this grid. Um, and essentially, uh, initially they um, did the tagging. And then I went through a second time um, just to kind of confirm. And so if I scroll down to the very, to the bottom, I just did some very basic Excel formulas to total up and then make, and then get percentages. Um, and so I'm still analyzing the data, but overall, um, from my experience of working at um, the office, um, a lot, still uh, 78, almost 79% of our programs uh, connect overtly to race, ethnicity, and then 55% for gender identity, sexual orientation, 47%, uh, disability, 26%, international, 22%, uh, socioeconomic class, 14%. Um, and then the list goes on. Um, and I will say that this is something I'm, I've initiated myself. My supervisor did not ask me to do this. Um, but it just was like this reflection piece that I wanted to do. So the second thing I'd like to share uh, is what I call a PCO, a program content organizer. And I have tried to do this for nearly all the programs I've done. Um, and so it just is like kind of my own template form. And so um, it has contact of the people, even if that's just me, equipment supplies, any marketing and outreach, catering, some new things that I've added only in the past year is thinking about what's our food like anti-waste plan. Um, also, you know, Zoom information, speaker, uh, our learning outcomes, how we're going to do assessment, um, also considering accessibility from the very beginning. Um, the program agenda. And then this is where I think um, this session today really goes in is the collaboration worksheet. And so I have a grid, uh, a table, and that you can always expand it to more than two people or two units. And so then we, you know, we do this together of like, okay, I'm going to do the email, you order the food, um, things like that. And then uh, also a table regarding the budget worksheet. So um, I think it's always interesting of you know what we think it's going to cost and then what it actually costs, and then also who's going to pay for it. And so when I think about collaboration, I think about communication, clarity, and um, and also hopefully uh, lessening conflict. <laughs> so. Um, that's just how I like to kind of be organized and also lessen anxiety and also hopefully increase um, collaboration. And then the other thing regarding collaboration that I just wanted to share, this is from Rebecca Gaja, R-E-B-E-C-C-A-G-A-J-D-A. -E -E and this is from a 2004 article. And here I'm highlighting on page 69, a graph that her article has, and the title is called Utilizing Collaboration Theory. And so from left to right, there's different parts, kind of this continuum of, of how she has thought and about thinking about collaboration. So from left to right, there's um, shared information and mutual support, and she notes that as, cooperation. Uh, second, common tasks and compatible go goals as coordination. 
integrated strategies and collective purpose, collaboration, and then unified structure and combined cultures coagination. And so um, there's also, she has some different principles. Um, and so I've also found that really helpful before entering a collaboration with a unit or even two units and people is to ask them, you know, um, what's been their experiences of collaboration? How do they define collaboration? And how can we set each other up for the most successful and the most hopefully enjoyable non-dramatic partnership? Um, so I'm also happy to uh, share this link or at least put the citation of Rebecca Gadge's um, collaboration article in the chat. Um, and I'll just end with saying that uh, collaboration is, is hard. Um, it's also a lot of work. Uh, it, if you think you only have a month, I would add another 50% um, to do it right. So collaboration takes time. Um, it's a process, which is also something that uh, Rebecca Gadja talks about. It's not a destination, but a process. Um, and uh, I'm sure we all have stories when collaboration has gone uh, really well and when it's also gone not so well. So with that, I will pass it along. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you, much. Liz. You gave me a ton of, you know, yes, yes, all the things because um, I absolutely agree that the most important is like just having those conversations and laying it out and writing it down when you lay it out so you can always lean back on that. So I appreciate um, all of what you just laid out. Um, my name is Emily Badix and I am the interim uh, director at the Longmore Institute on Disability at San Francisco State University. Um, I am a white woman in my late 30s. I've got some wooden dangly earrings and I'm in front of a little embroidery project hanging on the wall. Um, so the Longmore Institute, uh, you know, I think people think we have a bigger staff than we have. And I think that the reason for that is because we have been very fortunate to do some really exciting collaborations that help broaden our reach, um, allow, you know, me the experience of like having more colleagues and collaborating, which is just really fun when you're a small staff, uh, to get kind of adopted by other organizations for a little bit. Um, and so, you know, yeah, everything Liz said is, is stuff I was going to say in terms of just like hammer it out early. The the most, the, the few unsuccessful collaborations we've ha had have been where our interests align. And so we're so excited and, and like, oh, this is going to be great. But we forget to kind of lay out that foundation of what is your, what does your group need? What does your organization need? What do we need? What are our timelines? Um, the, uh, so I guess. I thought that the the most um, interesting collaboration we've had that might be hopefully interesting for people to to think about if if you were interested in replicating this model um, is that we have worked with a lot of arts institutions throughout the Bay Area um, as as a sort of unexpected partnership. I don't think we even really thought that we would do it. Uh, it started because we had built an exhibition of um, 504 history called Patient No More. And it's like if you've been married and you know how to plan a wedding, but you don't ever want to do it again, we suddenly had made this really beautifully accessible exhibit that really reached a lot of people with even got into some of the competing disabilities. Um, but we did not see ourselves as full-time exhibition designers <laughs> So we just were like, how do we take this? Oh, let's try to share it with as many other organizations in the Bay Area that will, you know, look at it and have conversations with us. So we invited a number of different museum staff professionals in for a like behind the scenes, we'll pull back the curtain, we'll tell you how we did things, we'll tell you why we did things so that you can see this really exciting model of access. Um, and in doing that, um, we built some partnerships and we learned what museums were already kind of starting to have disability questions. We created a sort of safe-ish space where I think a lot of the museums were able to air their guilty like, oh God, we're, we're afraid of being sued. We know we're totally dropping the ball on this. 
and we could kind of get them out of that moment of just total fear to like, well, then start doing something, <laughs> start small and you'll get better. Uh, and so built some relationships. So one partnership in, in particular that I think was really interesting was um, the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. So when they saw the exhibit, they had had it came at a time when they had really tried for a while to get a sort of disability conversation happening internally to the museum. And they had a few things that they were really worried about as like, oh, these are access things we know we're dropping the ball on, but you know, they're several million dollar expenses and we just don't know what to do. And so um, we started just by meeting with them. And uh, I think, I don't know, perhaps this is controversial because I completely agree that this expertise needs to be paid for. Uh, but I think that when you're starting a partnership with an organization that's not fully sure if they, they're they not yet aware how much they need the expertise, you kind of have to start by giving them a little bit for free to get in the door. And then it can really open up for them understanding how much they, they do need more and are willing to pay. So we started to kind of have a few meetings with them over the course of maybe three months to kind of talk through, well, what what might it look like? What have you done? You know, what have you tried? What what else could you try? And help them think through the idea of developing sort of an access charrette because they had all these things they were so worried about, but they hadn't really heard directly from disabled people. Um, so we really served as the middleman to then, and, and at that point we said, okay, well, you can pay us and we'll help bring disabled people to you and you can pay the disabled people we're bringing to. And um, so we had these access charrettes and brought people together into their space. And in doing so, you know, they they learned that a lot of the things that they were completely freaked out about were, were not actually things that people were worried about. They were like, oh, there's this other way we can go. Just tell us that when we enter the door and, and that's fine. Uh, and then there were things that they didn't know about that were actually really big concerns for folks. Like most importantly, in that case, uh, folks felt that their staff needed more training. Um, and so then we were also there to continue that relationship. We uh, came in and did staff training, um, a, a long series. We did four three-hour trainings so that every single person and their staff from their uh, highest up directors to their um, uh, recently hired you know, support staff or gift shop workers and uh, security professionals, that everybody was experiencing the same training. Um, and so that the culture really started to shift. And then they did a ton of things just afterwards without our involvement that was incredible. And they've really built these relationships to disability community. And then because of our collaboration, um, they also had disabled people coming because I think a lot of museums, they'll, they'll kind of do this work, but then they don't have the community relationships. So nobody comes and then they think, oh, well, why did we do that? Well, because people didn't know because you have a lot of work to do to build the relationships back up where it's worth it for people to come. And so organizations like ours that, you know, our, our core mission is to try and, um, you know, bring uh, disability as, as a, a site of celebration into more spaces. So we're, you know, we think of ourselves as an arts institution and it, it just made a lot of sense to partner. Um, and then, you know, it's continued to evolve. They're going to host our film festival this year. Um, so, which is, and they're they're giving really generous gifts back to us and how they're doing that and giving us the space for free uh, and many other resources. So it's just been a really exciting example of what those partnerships can look like um, with non-disability centered organizations. Again, the, you know, we have done many partnerships that I'm also happy if there's anything relevant to talk about. We've partnered with the Disability Visibility Project, um, with SINS Invalid, um, and with the CRIP Camp Impact Team. And those have just been really great in terms of when you're at a university, you have certain resources that you can use and platforms and things that sometimes are maybe harder for some of those organizations to work with. And then there's also things that those organizations can do and people that they can reach that, you know, inside of a state funded institution, we're maybe not able to sort of claim or do. And so those, those collaborations have been really exciting and vibrant too. 
Um, but, you know, if I had to think of like what makes us what we are, it, it really is defined by these collaborations because I think that's part of what our mission from the university perspective is, is that we're supposed to be a bridge that goes and takes the campus conversations and makes them connect to community engagement. Um, so it's been it's been a real pleasure to get to build these relationships and absolutely worthwhile and can expand the reach. Um, but but all those caveats that Liz um, really wonderfully laid out have been essential and, and we're still learning. We still make mistakes of like forgetting to stop and really have those tough conversations when you when you kick them off. So that's all I have to say. I will pass it off. Thanks. Molly, you're good to go. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Natty. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I am the senior coordinator of the Disability Cultural Center at the University of Arizona. Um, just quickly, I guess, my audio description. I, um, I think what stands out the most about me is that I have pink hair somewhat. Um, not all of it. I have bangs. Uh, winged liner and then my background is blurred. Um, you can't see my shirt but I'm wearing the feature is accessible shirt on me. Um, and then just to uh, kind of inform a little bit more about myself and um, the work that I do, uh, I am physically disabled uh, so I use a walker and a crutch to uh, navigate and then I'm also recently uh, neurodivergent with ADHD, anxiety, and depression. Um, so those are identities that I'm still kind of learning how to navigate um, and whatnot. Um, and I'm also a graduate student here at the University of Arizona in the higher education department. Um, so a little bit of what I'll be discussing is um, the partnerships and collaborations that our center has had um, both internally and externally. Um, a lot of our partnerships tend to be um, very, it, they tend to uh, be like for specific events. Um, so they're not um, typically like long-standing collaborative projects. Um, we do have a few that we're starting up and I'll mention those a bit later, but um, essentially to provide a little bit of history of DCC, if you didn't hear from Tony yesterday, um, we were started in 2018 and um, originally we were housed under the Disability Resource Center at the U of A um, for our uh, first two initial grant cycles. Um, and then very recently when um, we reapplied for grant funding for the 2021 through 2024 uh, years, we switched over to Office of Diversity and Inclusion, um, along with the other cultural centers on um, our campus. And I think that this switch has served us really well in that we have closer access to the other cultural centers, uh, more so than we did before. Um, because we on campus were a fairly new um, center, we didn't have a lot of visibility. Um, we struggled with having folks know that we exist and also know that we are different from the work that the DRC does. Um, and so I think shifting over to ODI, we were um, able to really be in the know of where the other cultural centers are regarding campus climate and issues that are happening um, locally and nationally. Um, and with that, um, last year, um, around the time when it, there was a lot of the protests going on um, due to police violence um, against uh, specifically Black individuals, but also um, Black disabled individuals, um, we were collaborating with the African American Student Affairs Center um, to do like readings on ableism and anti-Blackness, um, especially because on our campus, we don't have a large uh, student body that, um, disabled student body that understands disability in a politicized um, 
way and also as an identity. And so we thought that, you know, to also connect it with what's happening um, across the country, we decided to do this reading group where we had these uh, important conversations and whatnot. And so um, I think that was a really great partnership. Um, unfortunately, the uh, director, they had a uh, most of their staff ended up um, leaving the institution. And so they were kind of at a place where we couldn't continue a collaboration at this moment. Um, but we've collaborated with other cultural centers as well, um, such as with the Women and Gender Resource Center um, in with events such as like poetry open mic events, so more like arts um, and merging in um, other identities as well. Um, and I think something that I'll mention as well is our partnership uh, and relationship to the DRC on our campus. Um, because I think that having that uh, partnership is essential, um, especially in addressing the needs of students. Uh, although I will say that um, sometimes students do not have positive experiences with DRC. And so sometimes that's where we kind of come in and try to, um, I don't want to say address the gaps, but at least try to provide some kind of advocacy for students or seeing other types of resources that we can provide for students. As of recently, um, we've, the, I think our partnership has been strengthened because we, there are a lot of new access consultants who want to work with the DCC, who meet with students and say, you know, this student wants or is wondering if there's anything that addresses the isolation that they're experiencing on campus. Or this student wants to know if you have any workshops on um, like uh, time management for autistic um, individuals and programming like that, um, that then we are informed what students need and we go ahead and try to implement some of these programs that students um, are talking about with their access consultants. Um, and that, so I think that partnership in and of itself has been really uh, powerful in terms of um, addressing or um, being able to um, reach the students that maybe um, are nervous about getting involved with the Disability Cultural Center or don't use disability as an identity themselves. Um, I think being able to reach these students um, through DRC has proved very um, effective and also um, important in the work that we do. Um, we have a lot of external collaborations as well um, with uh, DIRECT, which is our independent living center uh, local, locally. Um, we, they helped us provide um, mental health counseling for students. Um, and then uh, provide we provide referrals to students who are having difficulties with like accessible housing off campus and transportation and all of that. Um, we have we did a session um, on disability and voting with the Arizona Center for Disability Law, and um, I think one really unique one that we had this past semester was um, with something called Jelly Wink Boutique. Um, they are actually a sex shop, a local sex shop here in Tucson that provides um, sex sex education to the community, but they also have um, workshops on uh, sex education and finding pleasure specifically for neurodivergent community members. And so we partnered up with them to provide those for the community because um, they're typically offered um, at a cost. Um, and so they're not always accessible to the community. And so um, when we partner with them, we're able to um, pay them for the work that they do, but also be able to provide this free of cost for the community. Um, and especially with uh, topics such as sex education and pleasure that aren't typically talked about um, in any other spaces, um, especially with neurodivergence. Um, and then lastly, there's a lot I can talk about, but I think one of the uh, last things that I can talk about is outreach. So when we um, reapplied for this last grant um, in 2021, um, 
I wanted to do more with outreach, um, specifically high school outreach and trying to create a college access um, or college pipeline for students to um, kind of understand what disability is like in higher ed, both in terms of like resources, but also with culture and identity. Um, and so with that, uh, we're gonna be doing yearly um, student symposiums. Um, we had the first one this semester, but it we had to do it all online. So I think it really uh, shifted um, the initial um, objectives of this symposium. However, we are now partnering a lot with local school districts. Um, we partner with the Tucson Unified School District and then some near ones um, in Phoenix. And um, within that, we're speaking with like special education practitioners who want to be more informed on what the accommodation process is like for students. Um, and so we kind of provide training. And then once the symposium comes around, we invite students and families to come into our campus and learn directly what the resources and services are at the U of A. And then um, also provide a brief uh, like intro to disability identity and culture for students um, and whatnot. And so I think this partnership in itself um, is more longstanding, I would say. Um, we've started these partnerships and because we're gonna be having these symposiums every year, um, I'm sure it's gonna, um, these, they're gonna grow. Um, and right now we're only working with um, Arizona um, school districts, but hopefully sometime in the future, we get to work with other um, districts and organizations um, as well. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more that we do that I can talk about, but I think I will leave it at that for now. Thank you, Maddie. And last but not least, we have Karen. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all again. So um, our center, as we've talked about in prior sessions, is um, very new and is technically not even open yet. Um, we're waiting for furniture delivery this summer. We had, uh, we've had the space for um, a year, but we had to go through some extensive renovations. Um, but Anne has been doing some community building work um, and supporting our student activists um, behind the scenes while waiting for the center to open and preparing to hire students and preparing for programming and so forth. So I thought what I would address a little bit is, um, um, it, I'm oh I did it again I forgot my introduction you have to poke me um, so I, I did this yesterday as well I'm Karen Nielsen I am the director of the disabled students program and also our disability cultural center um, however I will be changing campuses soon I am moving to UC Santa Cruz um, in um, in late July and um, really hope to be instrumental in helping that campus to bring a disability cultural center to fruition as well. Um, there's a, there is a, a, a movement there and, and a desire and, and I certainly will do everything I can to support it. So, um, in, so I am a, a, a white woman. Um, I have long brown hair. Um, I have brown eyes. Um, I am at home in my living room, um, rather casual on a Saturday. Um, I, I, I uh, use she, her, hers um, pronouns, and I identify as a person with um, mental health disabilities, including anxiety and depression, which have been part of my identity since I was uh, very young. Um, so that's that's my background. Now now I can now I can start talking about the rest. Um, so I think that what I wanted to add to the conversation is just um, from the perspective of uh, of a director of a a, a, a DS office. Um, I do come from kind of a different perspective in my approach to disability services, although I do recognize the. Um, necessity of compliance with the law. And I've always considered that to be the basement of the work that we do and only the starting point. 
And so um, the way that that relates to partnerships is that um, in order to focus more on retention and success for our students, we have worked really hard to build partnerships with different entities across our campus. And the advantage of that is that it also gives us the opportunity to make those spaces more disability inclusive and to build awareness and to build services that are specifically designed to meet the needs of different disability populations. So um, one of those partnerships, for example, that, that came about early on is um, that our campus didn't, did not have any um, general availability for um, career services for students with disabilities, specifically focused on the, the needs that students with disabilities bring um, into and the questions that they bring into the uh, future employment setting. So we created a partnership with the Career Center and hired a full-time um, career counselor who works with specifically with students with disabilities who want to work with them. Um, he is a person with disabilities and he um, helps students with first determining what um, which, what is the career what what is an, uh, uh, the career track that I should pursue? What, where will my strengths best be served? And um, where can I, where will I be able to contribute the most in the, in the future in, in my profession? And then other questions that come up for students um, about disclosure and about accommodations and um, all of the things that we have to consider when we're seeking new employment. So, um, so that was one partnership. Um, another partnership has been uh, more recent. We were able to obtain some money from the state to build a stronger partnership with our counseling and psychological services department and to bring a, um, a disability specialist to DSP who will um, be a, um, uh, a, special, a disability specialist, but also will um, do case management, help students to access one of the things that's most frustrating for students on a campus like Berkeley is the bureaucracy and how difficult it is to navigate. And even though we probably have served more services than many institutions, finding those services is almost like a treasure hunt. So this mental health disability specialist, their job will be to make sure that our students with mental health disabilities can find and access all of the resources and services that they need to um, uh, manage their disability and their health while they are um, in our in our uh, campus. So um, that's just a couple of examples of many partnerships that we've built, and it's given us the opportunity then to you know to sit down with um, Caps and say. You know what are some other ways that we can partner? So we have a we have a um, graduate student advocate who's been very vocal in his um, advocacy for a um, a unit in our caps and health services that will serve neurodivergent students um, in a in a in a more holistic way. And so we've been able to be part of those conversations as well. So I think partnerships are, especially in, a, in, a, in an environment of limited resources are where we can share the resources to, to meet goals for both partners or for more than two partners is the best way to, to be successful in the university environment. And, um, I also just wanted to acknowledge, I really have appreciated throughout the course of this, um, this symposium, which I have loved by the way, um, the conversations about you know where, where does the DCC belong? What is the partnership between a DCC and a, a DS office? What should it be? 
Um, and, and I love that, you know, people have different perspectives on that and different ideas about what will work best for their campus. And I think we should honor all of those and that it should always be an ongoing conversation. So for example, our DCC currently is aligned, is closely aligned with our DSP. That was the desire of the students who advocated for it. Um, and also the, the faculty and staff who were involved in, in bringing our DCC about. But that doesn't mean that, you know, five years from now or 10 years from now, that that will still be the best alignment. I think it's, you know, it's going to be depending on the needs of the um, student population, um, the users of the center, and, you know, the realignments that happen within the university and, and resources and all of that. So um, I think we should always be open to, to the best alignments uh, for those centers and um, keep having these discussions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. <clears throat> and thank you to all our panelists for those incredible insights. And we have about 14 minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to open the chat to everyone. And let's see, participants. So then you can also use the raise hand function or type your question in the chat. Um, and you can also direct message me if you want to be anonymous uh, with your question as well. And I'll, I will withhold your name. So take a little bit of time to think of any questions you have. All right, we have a hand raised from Jay Jen Pak. Hi, everybody. So uh, this has been a, a great symposium. So my name is Jay Jin Park. I am uh, a middle-aged Asian American male with dark brown hair, uh, with kind of a virtual background of a beach deck behind me. Uh, I am the community coordinate community education coordinator for the University of Illinois Chicago's Disability and Human Development. Uh, also connected with the Illinois LEND program and co-founder of Chicago LEND Disabled People of Color Coalition. And this has been a really interesting conversation. And my question is, uh, in addition to the on-campus partnerships and the disability-related partnerships, uh, do you all also actively or proactively linked to community-based organizations related to issues like uh, mental health services, social services, gender-based violence, awareness prevention. Uh, I ask because uh, I, though I'm connected with UIC and the disability community, uh, I've also worked in the community nonprofit sector around gender-based violence and mental health. And I've learned all of that is, although universities do our best to create a nice bubble, students also venture out into the community and don't exist in the bubble. And sometimes best services or resources possibly could be off campus. So just curious how you all navigate that and, and bridge those resources for your students. Thank you. This is Liz. Um, hey, Jajan. Uh, a few things came to mind. Uh, so Morris is uh, very small, um, although even though it's small, there's also that separation between the university and then the Morris community. So one, we have an Office of Community Engagement. So only in the past year, I've worked with them. And so I've really been like, OK, hey, you all already have these initial connections. And so I will partner with you to then better partner with the rest of the community. And um, so there's that. And I, I honestly, I don't remember. I can't remember if UIC has an office like that. <laughs> but um, 
but it's also, you know, UIC is so big that, um, but anyway, the other thing too that I thought about was um, something I'd like to do this year. A lot of our students typically have two different jobs, like an on-campus job and probably an off-campus job at like Dairy Queen or Subway um, or a local store. And so we've been hearing some grumblings about certain things, um, not all about disability, but some, but also in general, um, other things too. And so I would really like to um, do a dialogue as well as some kind of like training for our local businesses of how to work better um, and more effectively with our students. Um, because, you know, whether you're a big city like Chicago or a small town like Morris, um, yeah, I mean, they, they could live off campus, you know, they could stay, you know, after they graduate, what, you know, whatever. Um, so uh, that's initially what I'm gonna try and do. Um, and I think I'm just, again, gonna like really give myself time so maybe we don't do it till the spring and we really do like the more relationship building this fall. This is Maddie speaking. If I may add um, on our end, we have um, worked with like um, local organizations. Um, we did a, an event with Emerge, which is um, a domestic violence um organization here in Tucson um, where we really discussed um, gender-based violence especially within the disabled community um, but I've noticed that sometimes these collaborations also serve as a training for for them um, another one we've done is um, training for El Rio uh, Health Center um, and they actually reached out to us because they were trying to be more um, informed on best uh, cultural practices for disabled community members. And so um, El Rio tends to work a lot with like um, queer and uh, trans community members as well. Um, and so just acknowledging um, the uh, intersection of um, challenges and identities that the community members go through, it's something that we hope is um, continued and whatnot. Um, and Tucson, um, it's it's not that big of a city, so we there aren't a lot of um, organizations, for example, that do other work with uh, disability. There's there's few, uh, but we definitely try to always be um, connected with them. And and um, I mentioned earlier, Direct, which is our independent um, living center. Um, we also work with them longstanding and refer students who have issues with housing and all of that. All righty, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, if there are any other questions, feel free to raise your hand or post it in the chat. Um. This is Liz. Um, I was thinking also kind of when I shared like that big grid, um, I just wanted to add like initially, like what I initial sort of analysis is that um, like we, I realized we don't, we haven't done a lot with student athletes. Um, and also uh, someone mentioned earlier around, oh, I think um, it was Karen around like career. And so we also have a small percentage that was like overtly address career opportunities or career pathways. And so like with the student athletes, we know that one in four students are student athletes. And so that's a lot of people um, that we're, you know, we really haven't connected with. Um, and Additionally, I guess I wanted to, to say that, you know, also from that grid with the different identities, um, I found out that nearly 50% of our programs are also intersectional with at least two or more identities. And so while the disability part might have looked small, um, I think when I analyze more, I'll probably find that it's like disability and race, disability and queer, disability and, you know, so actually 
the intersections of the different identities will, you know, is much larger than like the initial like numbers might look like. And so that's also been helpful so far to see. So just about that intersectionality. All right, we do have another question in the chat. Um, how do you provide, and this might be the last question, we have about five minutes left. How do you um, provide safety and confidentiality for students, staff, faculty, activists you work with, if you work with any? How, how to build trust in environments where the university power broker is harming disabled people? Um, I'll just say a quick thing, which is that one of the things that um, the, the students who advocated for our center were most adamant about having is, is a safe space that they could reserve at their will to meet privately and confidentially to talk about anything that they want to talk about. And so um, a part of our Disability Cultural Center is a conference room that will be reservable only by um, community members, um, including students, to um, just in a very uh, accessible space, meet, talk, no, you know, with no need to report what's happening in that arena or to who's present in that arena, um, just to have a space because that on our campus spaces, it's such a premium that even finding an accessible space to have a meeting has, has been challenging for students. So that's that's one thing that we're trying to do. This is Emily. I mean, I think for me, it's been really important in bringing students together and giving them a space as Karen said, and then also really having to remind them of like what sorts of confidentiality we can't promise because I'm a Title IX reporter and like having to build that in so that that's really clear in terms of like wanting this to be a space where students feel safe and can talk about things, but also like just really owning the power that that we have as the leaders of the center of like whenever we're around, you need to understand that because we don't want you to feel that this is, you know, and I think that what that gets at is what some of the stuff of like how we need to challenge the the assumption that there can be a safe space inside of a university environment where there are such power structures that I think you're getting at there. So trying to kind of the best way to make it safe is to be really transparent about the power that we we hold or that the spaces that we ho hold. And then when there are things that are not, you know, Title IX violations that we can just then really help them strategize about how to how to be fighters in that um, power structure. And really, I mean, we've done that a lot with students who are struggling with uh, disability services or with a professor being able to be a really great resource of like, here's how professors respond to that. Here's some tactics you might use and let them be in community to, to share each other with each other so that students are all kind of empowering each other. This is Natty speaking. Um, if I may add, um, on our end, um, I am currently the only full-time staff at our Disability Cultural Center. Um, but one thing we've done in the past when we have student forums where we're asking for feedback or if students just need a space to, to vent or to really um, be in community with other um, disabled students and whatnot, um, we'll specifically um, say that me as a staff member will not be present or I remove myself from these spaces, even though I am a student myself, I think they know that I'm also a staff member and that I, at the end of the day, I do one have to have to be a mandated reporter, but also I do interact with other entities that might harm them as well. And although, you know, I have experience with student activism, like I would never do anything to compromise that. I think just 
to build that trust. I specifically remove myself from these conversations and have like our other student workers or graduate assistants be the ones facilitating um, information. And then they relate to me what was said um, in a way that, you know, is anonymous and um, can still maintain that trust for folks. So that's one of the ways we do it. Yeah, this is Liz. Um, on the student side, I do go to most of our student organizations. And so that's um, specifically our underrepresented student orgs. So that's, um, you know, probably four or five meetings on a weekly basis, um, as well as our student government. And it's kind of similar to, I think, what Natty just said, is that I always make it clear that if they want me to leave and re remove myself, I am totally fine with that and I, and I get it. Um, on the faculty and staff side, uh, it's been, uh, for about two years, I've been holding monthly uh, BIPOC, queer and disabled, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, queer and disabled, faculty and staff resource and support groups. And so at the very beginning, uh, I have a, a template slide deck that, you know, also really acknowledges those power dynamics. Um, not only, you know, with gender identity, but also, you know, you might have um, a director there or even uh, an assistant vice chancellor there um, or vice chancellor there um, along with, you know, an, an office assistant. And so we just really try to acknowledge that. Um, and also um, when we're, we're still doing it all by Zoom. And so we also, within the hour, um, have like group time and then we also are able with the breakout rooms to um, you know do like self-defined breakout rooms um, so that people can then say hey I want to I'd like to propose you know this identity breakout room whatever that might be um, and then um, they can also have a, a more dedicated space um, that might not be with their supervisor or might not be with their their colleagues. All right, thank you for those responses. And we are at our time. So thank you everyone for joining us for session B1, uh, building partnerships on and off campus. Uh, thank you to our access workers and to our panelists, Liz, Emily, Natty, Karen, thank you so much. Um, we are taking a break until seven o'clock central. So that's about one hour from now, 60 minutes. Um, and we'll come back together in the main Zoom room um, for our last session of the DCC symposium here. Um, <laughs> and it'll be a reverse panel. So it's an experimental session where, um, you know, not just we'll have, uh, you know, panelists that have appeared throughout the symposium, and we'll have all of our attendees be on one big Zoom call to co-mentor, share thoughts and ideas, reflect, um, and make disability culture, you know? Uh, <laughs> so uh, please join us for that. It is an unrecorded session, so uh, we will no longer be recording. Um, so if you want to say something in that session that you wouldn't say on a recording, you are free to say it in the session, um, you know, with, with limitations, of course. but. Um, yeah, so it's not recorded. Um, and yeah, we'll see you in one hour for the last session of the DCC Symposium. Thank you.